Tesla continues to disrupt in places that many of you probably already know about, but one of the areas is going to be in long haul, big transportation, and that's of course going to lead with Tesla Semi. Uh, today we're going to dive into it. My name is Paul Barron. This is Tech Path. Joining me today, of course, is Warren Redlick. Uh, great to have you back on the show, Warren. Thank How's you it going? for having me. Yeah. Uh, great stuff. We love to hear your breakdowns, your analysis. I love some of the models that you're also doing. I wanted to dive into Tesla Semi and kind of where we've started to see some news releasing both on limited supply, that's kind of the big thing. Pepsi, of course, wants as many of these things as they can get, as as well as many other companies. What's kind of the current state of Tesla's semi program? As I understand it, they've hired uh, people for manufacturing. The plan is to manufacture Tesla semi, and I'm not sure whether we're supposed to call it semi or semi. I get yelled yes. at whichever way I pronounce it. But right. I believe they're supposed to pronounce Tesla semi in Nevada in a building next to the Gigafactory. And I think initial plans are to produce five a week, and I'm sure right. the plans are to scale that up to much higher volume production. So yeah. my own model, I ballparked it at 5,000 in 2021. It's probably high. It's probably gonna be less than 5,000 produced in 2021, but this, they'll scale it up. There's a really, really big sure. market for semi. I saw a tweet out from Elon where he was basically talking about the limitations mainly on the, on the power packs and the battery capability or needs for that. And he was kind of referring to next year as being one of the major leaps in being able to go to production. Is that kind of what your research is showing? Well, right now they're in the early stages of manufacturing the 4680 high nickel cell, which is, there is no vehicle that needs that cell more than Semi. Semi yeah. needs, the, the battery pack being lighter is critical because the more the battery pack weighs, the less cargo you can carry because they have an 80,000 pound weight limit on semis in uh, tractor trailers in North America. So if your battery pack weighs an extra 100 pounds, it's an extra 100 pounds you can't carry. And the big advantage of the high nickel cells is they weigh less for the same amount yeah. of charge. So, yeah. and the semi uses about five times as many batteries as a regular vehicle. So it's a very battery intensive product. So, but for 2022, they're going to have scaled up production of the 4680 high nickel cell. They're going to be producing 100 gigawatt hours of that cell. Um, they're, they're going to have 200 gigawatt hours of capacity, expecting to produce 100 gigawatt hours of it. I think they may they may outdo themselves. But once they have that volume, then they can produce a really high volume of semi. Cybertruck is also supposed to use that cell. Right. So that's going to okay. So that's a 22 uh, where we'll really start seeing some of the ramp up uh, mm -hmm. for semi. In the, the case of where the market could kind of flow with semi, uh, a lot of variations here. What's it going to do to traditional trucking? What are some of the other transport areas that you see being impacted or disrupted most? So first of all, the market for semi in North America is about 250,000 currently diesel vehicles a year. China, it's over a million. India, it's over 500,000. So there's a monster global market for these vehicles. Um, so in the first place, it should cost less per kilo. It should cost the, if you're an operator of semis, they're gonna cost you less over time. You're gonna drive these mm -hmm. things for a million miles and they're gonna save you hundreds of thousands of dollars over that. They're gonna save you at least $100,000 over that million miles, maybe two or $300,000 because the electricity is gonna cost less than diesel fuel the maintenance is going to be less because there's a lot less stuff to fix. Uh, the design of it makes it uh, better. Like the windshield, the, the windshield design is much safer, much less likely to crack. So you're going to be off the road less with those kinds of problems. Um, so when you add all that together, it's going to, they're basically going to take over the entire market for semis. The other thing is they're probably going to be, when you get to the point where they're robo, when they operate on their own, or when, they, when you platoon, so you have three, let's say you have three or four uh, semis with their trailers running and there's a driver only in the front one and the other three, just they're just programmed to follow the front one. Um, you lower your labor cost if you're, if you're doing trucking. If you're able to get the quality of the self-driving up above human, then you're lowering, you're dramatically lowering your cost because you don't have to pay a driver anymore. So right. that's why it cuts into diesel semis. And then the other thing that people don't realize is that the semi market, the, these class eight work trucks compete with rail in different market segments. 
And mm -hmm. there have been periods of time when semi was the diesel semis were getting more efficient and they cut into rail share. And then the rail pushes back and they find some more efficiencies and they cut back into the same the share that the semis are taking. But now you take D, uh, electric semi and you cut the say the cost per kilogram mile in half, maybe better than that, then you're just going to take a lot of share from trains as well. So the market for semi is actually more than the mar the market for Tesla semi is greater than the market for semis in general. So you're talking yeah. about potentially more than two million vehicles a year at a you know average selling price of $150,000 or more. It's huge. All right, so Warren, when you look at uh, Peterbilt, Mack, Freightliner, all those, typically they have a pretty big infrastructure and, and also there's a certain level of proficiency in being able to work on vehicles like that. If you look at Tesla really making a dent in traditional you know, Freightline, which is gonna be a, a scenario here, maintenance and serviceability, especially out on the open road, what do you think is the strategy to be able to kind of complement that? Obviously, we have service, center, service centers for the cars. We have the supercharging stations. There's some infrastructure there, but when you get into Tesla Semi, it's a little bit different. What are your sure. thoughts there? So first of all, Semi should require a lot less maintenance. There's no oil changes, right? There, there's, there's a lot of parts in a diesel Semi that you don't need for an electric Semi. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, I believe that the underlying hardware for Semi is going to be fairly similar to the underlying hardware for a Tesla vehicle. It's an electric motor, okay. battery pack. Yep. Um, my impression is that they're going to charge at separate, because they're going to set up, they call them mega chargers instead of superchargers, because it, it's, such a, it's such a much larger mm -hmm. battery pack. And I would not be surprised to see them set up some kind of special service facilities at those mega chargers. Uh, you know, so this is an open question. We don't know the answer to yet. How much service yeah, will they need? You're right. Yeah, it's exactly. I mean, even even with my own Tesla vehicle, uh, I'm finding different kinds of service things that are a little different. But I'm also finding things that are interesting in the sense of we own ICE cars and also uh, the EVs and the difference in terms of where service is actually being done. Tires, you go through a little bit quicker. Obviously, you just, you know, it's a different kind of thing, but brakes, you barely touch if you're on regen. I can imagine that's gonna be the case in semi. So a lot of those kind of factors. When you when you mention the service centers, because uh, typically what you've got with, you know, open road is you've got these vehicles out there, and in most cases, this is old school truck stops. You know, the greasy spoon, these vehicles all parked out there. Definitely no advanced charging systems. But they have, good, seen... they have good barbecue, though. Good barbecue. <laughs> yeah, good barbecue. Good chili. Good chili. Out there in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Truck Stops America, I think, is, you know, they're one of the bigger ones. Do you see some of them actually transitioning over to being able to accommodate these vehicles? If they want to remain in business, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if if Tesla Semi is going to replace diesel Semi, then you better be ready for, de for uh, electric semis. I, I don't see a way out of that. Frame. Yeah, What's let's it? talk about the time frame. Uh, what do you think we're seeing here? Is this a five-year uh, rollout uh, to, or maybe up to a decade? I would say it's in the ballpark of five years, yes. And I think yeah. you've got to remember, you know, one of the things we should talk about is Tesla moved Jerome Guillen from president of automotive to president of heavy trucking. Yeah. And Jerome Guillen has a history of working in heavy trucks. And people mm -hmm. looked at this as like a demotion and people don't, anybody who says that about doesn't understand who Jerome Guillen is. Jerome mm -hmm. Guillen owns 500,000 shares of Tesla stock. Yep. That means he's got a net worth of over $300 million. I think, I think 3. 350 million now after yesterday. So he doesn't have to take a demotion, right? He's not doing this because he's worried about his position in the company. He wants to grow Tesla and he sees his ability to grow Tesla most effectively in an area where he's most comfortable, which is heavy trucking. Yeah. And um, he is the bomb. He is he is a big time leader who understands trucking better than anybody else at Tesla. And he is going to help Tesla move into truck heavy trucking more effectively than anyone else would. That, that move was right. deliberate and it wasn't a demotion. It was a this is the right job for Jerome. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, this is something that often people say, you know, who, who is the competitor? It's not necessarily other EVs. It's going to be the ICE vehicles and kind of the infrastructure that we have currently. Any potentials that you see coming down the, the line? Because I could you could look at this from a legislative standpoint, both at the state, national level, to where there could be a lot of implementation to kind of help pave the road for this 
uh, transition. What are your thoughts? Do you see any kind of movement there? I know you have a little bit of political background, um, and we've seen some some big moves with uh, Biden and this uh, new infrastructure plan. So maybe there's something here. I don't think that Tesla needs help. I think Tesla built its supercharger network without help, and they will build a mega charger network without, without help. The capital cost to Tesla of building out a mega charger network is going to be trivial. Um, and it probably goes along with the supercharger network. They have the experience of laying out the supercharger network already. They can build right. on that experience to build out the mega charger network and the support network for semi. Um, a lot of Tesla maintenance is done mobile. You know, a vehicle comes to you. So it's very possible that and, you know, the, the vehicles are walking computers. So the vehicle is going to know what's wrong before somebody shows up and they'll know, do we need to tow this thing or do we need to can we fix this on site? So I think there's a lot of, I think those problems are going to be less with Tesla Semi than they are with diesel semis. Yeah, this is going to be it's going to be fun to watch because I think yeah. I think this is a big opportunity for uh, freight movement and definitely mm -hmm. could change a lot in the air carrier space too if you think about it. You know, for yeah. long haul, even in short to intermittent long haul, uh, air carriers just because of the demand on on what we've seen. Um, that has been impacted in terms of speed. So yeah. this could come back into a, a very interesting just scenario. Really, just really quick Go on ahead. the politics point. Um, I, ha I saw nothing in Joe Biden's speech, and I have seen nothing in the Green Act or the Competing Electric Vehicles Act that talks about semi. This is right. one of those things where politics lags reality. Okay, Reality mm -hmm. has caught up, and Tesla's already building out a supercharger network, whether you like it or not. It's very mm -hmm. nice for Grandpa Joe to say, hey, we're going to build 500,000 chargers. Uh, Tesla's already doing it, you know, and if they do some grants and, and other credits to help to, to to make it easier and it lowers Tesla's cost or gives Tesla some kind of tax breaks, great. But, you know, they didn't even mention mega chargers. They're, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm cynical about all politicians, but I'll pick on Grandpa Joe for a minute and just say, you know, he he did a commercial during the 2020 campaign where he talked about how we're going to start building electric vehicles in America. And he was talking about Chevrolet. Is like, does he not know about Tesla? <laughs> like, I don't. I seriously wonder whether Joe Biden has ever mentioned the word Tesla. If he, yeah. if he has ever mentioned Elon Musk's name, I, I don't know that he. I suspect he's aware of Elon Musk's existence, but he has never acknowledged Elon Musk's existence. He did not acknowledge launching astronauts to the space station. Um, I, I don't. And 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 the the lack of awareness of Tesla Semi. And Tesla vehicles is a sign that, and that's not particular to him. That's to me, that's all politicians. Mm -hmm. They lag reality. The technology is advancing so fast, and they're like, "Wait a minute, Facebook's tracking people's personal information." Yeah, the rest right. of us do that for five years. Thanks for catching up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So the likelihood is is this is kind of a solo uh, potential to kind of get into really kind of the disruption space of of where long haul freight will go. So I'm very interested in how this is gonna fly anything that you could see coming out of the woodwork in terms of wow really didn't think that would happen in relationship to to semi i think most people don't see china and india coming yeah. china and india pe people see semi and they see a big potential market and in the tesla community there's a lot of talk about what's going to happen in india because india is the second largest first or second largest population in the world but a much poorer economy than china yeah um so people want tesla to make electric vehicles for India, but India's car market is um, it's just much lower end. There's there's very little market for vehicles as expensive as a, even the future Tesla, the $25,000 Tesla they talked mm -hmm. about. It's a very small market. It doesn't make sense. But their semi market is twice as big as the North American market. So mm -hmm. I think seeing a Tesla gigafactory in India producing battery cells and semi and maybe some solar or uh, grid storage devices, that would make sense. And then China has four times the market. Pe this is one of those things like people talk about, like people still think America is the greatest country on earth. And I, I'm very fond of it. And I live here and I'm not leaving. But the practical reality is China has a bigger economy than we do. We, people yeah. don't want to believe it. People will argue about it. There's no question. If they have four times the market for semi, they have to have a bigger economy than we do. And you yeah. can measure yeah. economies in different ways. Uh, but their their economy is huge. So the potential, when you talk about Tesla Semi in the U.S., you're talking about 250,000 vehicles a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe more because you take out some rail. But sure. when you add in India and China and Europe, then 
it might be 10 times the market outside the US as there is inside the US. And that's not something we're comfortable with because we're so used to being the biggest. The Chinese EV yeah. market is bigger than ours too. Chinese oh, vehicle market, yeah. the Chinese vehicle market is bigger than ours. Yeah, I just saw the numbers on uh, the 2021 numbers from uh, China EV. And I was surprised at just the number. Now, granted, there was a lot of them that were in that, um, you know, I think it's SGMW uh, that is the super small vehicle that right. it was kind of taking over in terms of the total total sales. Tesla still held, our, held their own in terms of sales over there.